Sarah, and look, uh, my voice all right? You can, everybody can hear me? Yeah, hearing you well. Great, thank you. Look, um, thanks for the opportunity to come and join you tonight. I mean, uh, I, I just want to congratulate the Next Gen team, you, Sarah, and team. Um, I think the work that you're doing is absolutely fantastic. And, uh, you know, thinking about the future and um, the continuous improvement that this organisation has always been on, but continues to do, and particularly about the future is really, really important. So I just give full credit to you and the team. I think the project that you've uh, enabled and, and are further developing and even using this technology to communicate with the wider audience is just absolutely fantastic. So from me, well done. Um, I thought maybe there's, there's a couple of things before I open it up for questions uh, that would be a benefit. And maybe I'll just chat a bit about myself um, and where I come from. Uh, and that gives you a bit of an insight in regards to my skills and experience and, and broader knowledge of CFA um, and how I come to be in the position of a deputy chief. And then uh, I was going to also cover the, the Southeast region, um, you know, what that broadly means, what I'm responsible for and talk a bit about that. And then also cover um, the office of the de deputy chief officer, because I'm sure people, you know, you interact with your districts you see your commanders, you see your ACFOs, um, you see them on a day-to-day -day basis in some cases, and you certainly interact with district support officers, but you may not know exactly what the role of the region and what we do day-to-day -to, -day to support CFA as the organisation. And then I thought maybe we'll open it up for some questions that you may have on anything that I've discussed or anything of general. And if I can't answer it tonight, then I'm certainly happy to, to follow up um, and, and get back to you. Now, I am mindful too that you had uh, Steph last week um, and for those who joined and look steps right at the heart of the reform piece and obviously has got all the knowledge uh, in terms of the the background in regards to what's going on with the latest information in terms of the reform so if you do have questions in regards to that nature be mindful that i'm not at that uh, table all the time but i certainly got some knowledge and we, we can't we'll certainly follow that up so a bit about myself uh, and how i come to be uh, like many in cfa uh, my, my family was in CFA. Uh, my father started when I was incredibly young, only about three. Uh, and then he got a transfer to District 11 or Region 11 back then, and he was an assistant RO. And you came in at two tiers back then. So back in those days, there was you either come in as a career firefighter or you come in at the middle management level. And he came in at the middle management level. And we went to uh, District 11, Bansdale, and grew up through my primary school years into the secondary school, and the family absolutely loved it. Spent seven years, and back then, that was unusual because every five years at the most, the regional officers, the deputy regional officers, and the assistant regional officers used to get rotated around the state. The board used to make a decision, and your whole family was uprooted, and you left and you went to wherever they decided within the state. But as a first step, everybody came out, um, and then spent time in the country areas. And then uh, through promotion, you then came back into more of the, the city um, areas. But uh, I'd done things like most at that age, you know, played a bit of footy, been in Cubs, been in Scouts, and then uh, was often back then it was a, CFA was really a family affair and your weekends were spent with dad out amongst brigades doing stuff. So I read real attraction to, to what he was doing in the community and working with volunteers. So from there, I, uh, at age 11, um, I decided, well, I'll go away from Scouts. The fire brigade seemed quite attractive and it was the early stage I could get into it. And I joined Mount Taylor Brigade in District 11. And I sort of had the choice. I could have gone to the juniors, and I see Les's on there, uh, at Bairnsdale, uh, but I elected to say, no, no, I'll go to the rural setting. And I liked that because the running competition was really hands-on, you know, climbing ladders, operating pumps. Um, it was really physical and when the juniors, we know that the running team is a little bit more dry events than it is some of those really arduous events that you see in the rural competition. So that really attracted me and I did that for a few years. And then Dad got a transfer uh, back to Lilydale and the family came from Dansdale up that seven years. I was in about year eight back to, um, back to Melbourne and uh, joined Belgrave as a junior. Then started in the seniors and then not long after that finished my secondary education and Dad got a transfer to Wodonga, and that's what happened in those days for promotion. So he was then, at that stage, the regional officer, um, similar to what we have as an ACFO today or previously an operations manager. So 
went to Wodonga and uh, did quite well out of school doing, you know, retail and, and things like that and was quite successful, but really had this enthusiasm about following and making what was a great hobby into a career. And uh, so with that, uh, decided that uh, I'd get into the fire service and uh, at that stage, you know, see if they weren't recruiting for a number of years and uh, that was in the early 90s. So as a result of that, um, I had an opportunity to go to a private fire service, which was Circo GM at Pakapunyal, and spent 12 months there. And that was the time when the military were uh, changing from what was the engineering side of things where the fire service was run. They were at a number of bases moving to um, a private um, companies to do that with not just fire, but a whole range of things, security as well. So the job was a bit of, it was fire, uh, and then uh, a weekends was, was a security type duty. So it was, uh, it was a, an interesting time. I spent 12 months there and then CFA then finally uh, were able to recruit. Uh, and I managed to get in and uh, started, I uh, did full recruit course and then started at Springvale as a recruit firefighter. And from there I've, uh, you know, progressed through, um, uh, through the career, um, you know, from when I was a volunteer, even at Wodonga, um, getting into Pakapanyal, spending 12 months, then getting into CFA, which meant that I had to take my new family and move to Melbourne. Um, from there, going through the ranks of career firefighter, um, you know, all the way through to qualified firefighter, qualified leading, leading firefighter and station officer. So I spent a fair bit of time on the station as well. But in amongst that, I had some rare opportunities where uh, there was the creation of like Southeast Group that was known as what they call an operations area and it converted into a group. And I was one of the first career persons to basically become a deputy group officer, um, which was unheard of at the time. As, and I was at that stage a station officer. So... Uh, that provided me a, a really good insight into a group level. Um, and uh, from there I went to, uh, as I spent some time around relieving as a station officer and a leading firefighter, uh, then had the opportunity to do some higher duties as a, what we know as previously an operations officer, now a commander in District 24 for a period of time, and then came back and was asked to uh, do some high duties at Dandong Fire Station, which turned into a full-time um, job and at that stage, you know, Dandenong on fire station as it is today. I mean, it's a huge brigade, uh, huge risk. So it was an almighty challenge for somebody young like me to come in, and, and I'm very um, appreciative of those that had confidence in me to give me a go. So I spent nearly five years at Dandenong, on, uh, you know, looking after being the officer in charge of that brigade and a catchment of volunteer brigades as well. Uh, loved the job, uh, loved the interaction with a lot of uh, career firefighters and uh, and volunteers and really enjoyed my time at Dandenong Fire Brigade and Fire Station and the catchment at South East. Um, from there, uh, I spent some time doing some higher duties at uh, District 8 as the operations manager and then uh, had the opportunity to become the operations manager in about 2008 um, and spent five years in that position. So incredibly busy I step back, very busy, big fire station, uh, integrated fire station, loved that, but also then took over what is um, probably the one of the most challenging districts um, in CFA in terms of risk environment, you know, the amount of career firefighters, volunteers and, and so forth. And then uh, did that for uh, on five years and then uh, took up the opportunity to become the assistant chief officer. And that was the change when they had previously had regional directors that didn't necessarily, not all had a, an operational background. Um, then moved to more of an operationalised position where um, you had business acumen and also operational experience. And that's when they um, set up the replaced regional directors with uh, assistant chief officers. So that's a bit about my background and how I come to be where I am. And then more recently, there's been, and I'll speak about a little bit later, the rank alignment which meant that my position, which hasn't job changed, but it's become the deputy chief officer because the operations manager's positions to get alignment with what is in the Metropolitan Fire Brigade, getting ready for the creation of FRV and getting sector-wide alignment meant that operations managers became assistant chief fire officers and therefore it would become confusing if my position was to remain as an assistant chief officer, considering that those positions report to me which I'll talk about when we get into a little bit further. So I'm now the Deputy Chief Officer look after Southeast Region 
And that basically entails everywhere from Edafal, if I take it to that point, sort of that Springvale boundary of where CFA interfaces with um, the Metropolitan Fire Brigade, and that runs all the way through to Mallacoota um, as well. So underneath that, um, you know, there's five districts um, that I also look after. So it's it's quite a uh, unique, you know, I've got heavy commercial, um, industrial, residential areas um, in amongst very gro developing growth areas in Melbourne, uh, all the way through to the remote areas uh, that we see right in the Far East. Um, Sarah, are you able to share that uh, document that we sent earlier? Is that possible? So hopefully you can see that. I thought it might be just worthwhile just assisting in the explanation about the region. So CFA has five regions and we've got 21 districts that sit underneath those five regions. And those regions extend from the southwest to the west to the northwest, to the northeast. And my responsibility on behalf of the Chief Officer um, is to look after the southeast region. And in southeast region, um, you know, we've got 223 fire brigades, and that's made up of 193 uh, volunteer brigades, um, 12 that are integrated brigades. So they have that staff and uh, volunteer composition. We've got 11 Coast Guard brigades, and they're an important asset for us to be able to provide a level of marine response. Uh, and we've got the forest industry brigades and headquarters brigades, which we've got seven of, and that totals up to a 223 fire brigades in the southeast region that, as I said, spans from all the way down the peninsula, Edafal, Springvale, all the way through to Mallacoota. Um, you know, we've got three, three workshops uh, that we support, um, you know, and I talk about district mechanical workshops. We've got the Cranburn workshop, the Moey one and the Bensdale. And I'm sure at odd times you've had interactions with our district mechanical team and they are absolutely fantastic and legends in, in ensuring that our equipment um, is kept to the best of its can for ready for response at any given moment. So uh, we've got 13 incident control centres um, across the patch. Um, interesting though, there's probably a, there's a mixture of those facilities which are CFA owned um, and DELP owned. And when we respond to incident patrol centres, obviously we're all agency these days. So, you know, at on we own the facility um, and DELP and other agencies come and use that facility and we interact and do our business as one team. Just as, you know, Bensdale, for example, um, it's the DELT facility uh, of which we all come together and we support like we have done for the East Gippsland fires utilising Bensdale, Swifts Creek and Orbos, which are DELT facilities. So across that patch, we've got a mixture of ownership in terms of who's responsible for ICCs, but we've got 13 of them. And we've got 242 fire stations, and that's huge when you think about it. Um, so you go back, we've got 223 brigades. So how do we end up with 200? 42 fire stations. Well, those 242 fire stations, um, there, are, there, there is some of those which are satellite stations. So they've simply got a truck in there. They're not actually, they, you know, the affiliated might be closer to a community, but they're effectively connected to one main brigade, but we've got a truck that might be just in a one shed station. Uh, volunteer members, we've got nearly 9,000 volunteer members, the, the 70 district staff that work across Dandenong's office, across the uh, Warrigal office, um, Morewall District 27, Sale District 10 and Bensdale District 11. Um, we've got uh, 23 regional staff that, that work in amongst that. Most of those staff work in at Dandenong. Um, uh, and, but there are other regional staff that also work as far as District 11 and in Bensdale, that that's their home location, so they're regional staff. We have what we call embedded staff, um, and embedded staff are a range of uh, support that comes to regions and districts that comes from headquarters, and they could be, um, you know, through fire safety officers, vegetation management officers, they could be... Um, uh, you know, HR specialist, um, business partners, et cetera, to help us and assist us in the running, but they're actually centrally managed, but they uh, work in and for each of those districts and the region, um, but they're actually centrally managed from headquarters. And the fire station staff, 322, and we've got 450 um, other staff that also support that as well, support across the region. Um, 
78 pumpers. Uh, and, you know, you think of, in terms of some of the reform, um, you know, we're losing, I think, 13 of those pumper appliances that will transition um, out of FRV, um, which might be 14, I think, in, the, in all that moves across to FRV. So that shows you that um, clearly CFA still has a big responsibility in providing an urban fire service in many communities across Southeast region, as they will continue to do across the state of Victoria. So we're running 78 trucks of which we will lose 14 in that uh, change to, to FRV. We retain all the CFA tankers. Um, so the 365 tankers will remain in CFA. Um, and we've got 117 transport vehicles and 194 other vehicles that are also um, supporting our business and our operation across the region. There are well over a million people and the, and the, the population growth in the outer metropolitan area, particularly in that District 8 interface, is, is growing and growing at a huge rate in the corridors of Casey and Cadinia. Um, so that's you know, the, the bit of the budget uh, stuff which may be of interest. You know, we're running a budget um, and of about $8 million, but that's not really the true figure. So when you look at it annually, it's over $50 million to run this region. Um, and, and when I talk of that, that doesn't, that figure of $8 million doesn't include the, you know, the changes and updating of appliances that we see come in, the building works that occurs with the updating of either refurbishment of some fire stations or brand new fire stations. But on average, it's about $53 million to run the fire service in CFA across that patch of Southeast region. Um, but on a, on a, on a, I suppose on the level that we operate day to day, managing that budget, it's about $8 million. Um, and of course the responses, we're doing over 30,000, you know, brigade activity is over 30,000 responses um, annually, um, you know, with the 15 or nearly 16,000 uh, primary calls and, and uh, 15,000 um, support calls. So thanks, Sarah, for, for sharing that. Um, I just wanted to put that into context because it is a big region. And, and when you look at that too, you also consider that, as I said before, the, the, the big commercial, industrial and residential assets that CFA looks after, there is critical infrastructure everywhere from down the peninsula which, uh, which has major petroleum assets um, and other critical infrastructure to do with power and, and, um, and gas. And then also more broadly, all the way up to places like Marlow where we've got gas facilities. And then if I take you back into the centre um, with the powerhouse of District 27 that provides us with our ongoing power supply out of Moorle and Terrellman. So, you know, there's a lot of critical infrastructure. Some of it's known, some of it's what not well known. Um, and even for many, they don't even realise that once you get up into places like uh, the Marlows, the Orbosts and things like that, they don't even realise that we've got some critical infrastructure there to do with gas. Um, so it's quite broad. The risk from East Gippsland being in the, you know, big, uh, you know, heavily laden bush environment all the way through to grass farmland, all the way through to that um, heavy industrial, commercial and residential area. So it's got a mixture of everything. Um, the, the, the risk environment goes everything from, um, you know, the tourist aspect to it through to farming, uh, through to recreation and and uh, and then in between that we've got all the the technical um, commercial um, and industry that supports all that so it's a bit of a mixture of everything I think in this particular region. Thanks, Sarah, so what what does the role of the the deputy chief? What do we do? Um, well, on a day to day basis, we're probably the connector between or we are the connector between the state and the districts. So I'm on a day-to-day -day basis having conversations with the regional leadership team and uh, helping and assisting uh, turn what is the strategy that's developed at headquarters into action because every district, every community, every group is different and we've got to respect that what comes out of headquarters needs to be tailored to a point where it's meaningful and it's beneficial for each district, each brigade. Um, so my job is to take the strategy um, that's developed at headquarters, which is through policy and so forth, and turn that into action and guide and assist and support and direct where required back into those districts. 
So with the five districts, I'm frequently having discussions with them about a whole range of different issues and supporting that. Um, my team looks after everything to making sure that things like vehicle topology, you know, where's the next set of trucks, where are they to go within the region um, so that we can inform the state on our priorities. Um, so what does that look like? We also influence where we can the um, infrastructure that needs to occur and the priorities of those infrastructure. So we go to great length and it's not always realised to go through uh, brigade by brigade and work out um, you know, when, when the next set of vehicles are coming through and which is the highest priority based on risk. And we have a great depth of information to make that assessment based on a whole range of different parameters which support that. And then even for building infrastructure, you know, it's not just simply the age of the building, it's, it's a whole lot of other dimensions and factors in terms of growth um, and OHS health and safety type issues, fit for purpose that we need to assess and then determine when we do get funding, where that's best spent. So there's that sort of piece as well. And I don't get out of the HR aspect. Um, I deal with some of the more um, you know, serious uh, HR issues that we might see from time to time. Um, but generally, um, can I just talk to that HR aspect generally? You know, CFA is a, a big organisation, you know, running over 56,000 volunteers, you know, we've got 1,223 fire brigades across the state or thereabouts across the state of Victoria. It's a big organisation. And when we bring people together from all different walks in life um, that come from different um, backgrounds, uh, that includes education experience, life experience, age groups, you name it. And we all come together for a common purpose. And that common purpose is to respond and support our communities um, in times of an emergency. So we do that and by and large, you'd be surprised, we don't have a huge amount of HR type issues. We do have some, I don't ignore it, it doesn't matter like any business you get or any organisation you're running, you will have that from time to time. But when you think of the complexity of what we deal with, I think by and large, we, we do have a culture and an organisation generally that treats one another with, um, uh, with the good CFA values. Now that's not to say that's for everybody because there are odd times, but generally I'd have to say that we do that quite well. But there are times when I have to, uh, you know, support as the next level if it does escalate both in a staff issue or a volunteer issue. And I do that through the assistance of a good team and I've got a, a human resources business partner that supports us in the region to do that. So I have a, an immediate team around me, um, a, a support coordinator, which is like, um, a, you know, in a way, an executive assistant that looks after my diary and, and does all my, um, or a lot of my work, I probably should say, that allows me to um, think freely, um, to be able to think strategically at times. So she does a wonderful job at managing me uh, and managing my workload that comes in on a day-to-day -day basis. And you may have, may have through different times contacted or had discussions with Linda if you've been trying to get in contact with me. And then I have, um, uh, you know, support, there's regional support um, officers, there's a regional business manager, Jess, that looks after the business aspects, because there's a huge budget, we I talked about before, you know, the overall budget, we're around $53 million, so breaking that right down, we've got to have good support in the planning um, to make sure that, you know, that what we're doing and, and where we're um, applying good governance and procedures and the whole of business, even down to business continuity plans, um, is being managed and managed well. And, and Jess does a fantastic job at that. Um, and I've also got two regional project coordinators um, that also assist in some of that more technical work that I need, you know, some more really thinking grunt to be able to work on. And they are the people that often pull together regional level things like the vehicle topology and the infrastructure. Uh, risks and so forth in consultation with the districts and the DPCs uh, and so forth. That's just a, a small snippet of what they do. They, they do on a day-to-day -day basis everything from helping me with some of the reform stuff as much as, um, you know, some of the strategic and planning work that falls out of the higher levels of headquarters and turning it into something that's meaningful at a district level that we will tailor for our approach across the region. Uh, and then off, off, off that, we've got the five districts, as we touched on before, which then have got their ACFO with their district business manager that support and run the district. So the district's the face of CFA, 
It's the face that interacts with, um, on a local level, everything from the municipal um, fire and emergency, uh, emergency planning committees to fire prevention um, um, committees, um, to dealing with the police on a local level, to dealing with AV, to dealing with all that that occurs in local communities on behalf of the district. But then, then they also interact, obviously, in the face four brigades as much as our local community. Um, we couldn't have 21 districts across the state report just to headquarters. It's just too big, it's a span of control, but they are the face of CFA. They are the people that interact with you, but under, behind them is people like myself and my team that do a lot of that grunt work to be able to think through strategically about positioning our region, our districts, ultimately to our brigades and how we do our business. So I might pull it up there, Sarah, for any questions. That's probably a quick overview um, about uh, a bit about myself, a bit about the, um, the region um, and what we look after, and also a bit about the role of the, the DCO, which is probably only a snippet of really what I do, but hopefully that gives you just a bit of an insight. Thanks, Trevor. Um... Any questions from anyone for Trevor? Um, did you get the question we had earlier in regards to EMR, Trevor? Yeah, so EMR is an interesting one. And I, um, I've been a very passionate person about emergency medical response because I honestly believe in it. Um, and uh, and not, it's not overly well known, but um, CFA um, back in 1998 actually piloted EMR. Uh, well before anybody else did for a short period. Um, and that was done out of Springvale. And that was when I was a firefighter and uh, we piloted the emergency medical response or it was called emergency medical, medical support back then. And then it was decided for a whole variety of reasons that we wouldn't proceed down that line at that stage. Um, and that came out of decision at the time um, from the board and the chair. And that was simply because we we're rolling out minimum skills and a whole range of other things at the time. And it was just seen to be too big a task to try and even consider um, doing a medical response on top of our day-to-day -day duties. So emergency medical response has evolved since then. And, you know, CFA brigades, our volunteer brigades, uh, six of them kicked it off. And then in more recent times, we've had our career firefighters that have picked it up um, and also obviously MFB that have been doing it for many, many, many years. So uh, we have evolved with EMR and of those, well, I think we've still got the three volunteer brigades now because some have been uh, transitioned to the staff, et cetera. But um, emergency medical response, uh, as far as I'm aware, will continue on and it will continue to grow across the organisation. Um, we have brigades out there now that arguably provide a level of medical response. And one that comes to mind is Orbost. Um, if you talk to Dick Johnson, the captain at Orbost, in the background, um, when there is no uh, ambulance available and as a last resort, they ring the brigade, the brigade responds, they've got a DFib, and on many occasions they've done good work and saved life. Um, so that's not well known. So I think there is an opportunity for CFA to continue to grow that. Um, we've got to be mindful that there is um, the community emergency response teams that Ambulance Victoria run. Um, and I think there is a correlation between volunteer services of that nature and CFA. And we have seen where we do have EMR brigades, um, people join those EMR brigades that have either from a nursing background, in some cases there are even doctors or medical practitioners that are not so much interested in fire, but they do have an interest in emergency medical response. So in certain communities, um, I think that there, it is, is something that CFA will continue to look at. I know they're continuing to look at. Uh, and in con continued consultation with Ambulance Victoria, it will be a discussion based on risk. And if a community and AV, it's not sustainable, um, it, it's not worth, uh, you know, you couldn't put a full-time ambulance or uh, increase the ambulance service as a fallback mechanism I can see it where emergency medical response, if of the volunteer brigade, and it would only be at the um, at the at the permission of the the volunteer brigade if they wanted to do so, would um, in the future do emergency medical response. It's probably a long-winded question, uh, right answer, should I say? But um, I do hope that it continues to grow. I do hope that brigades in the future generations see that as a a benefit to not only 
um, you know, the, the medical side of things, but achieving, I suppose, a level of broader emergency response for their community. And rather than create another service to do that, I think there is an opportunity if the brigade has that capability and if they choose to do so, could um, perform that role into the future. So my understanding is that we will, um, we will continue to grow. The next question that I had was in regards to the ranks. Um, and if I can just touch on that for a moment. So just so everybody's clear, operations officers, as we once knew them, the tiling went to commanders. And then uh, our operations managers, which we knew for many years, have gone to assistant chief fire officers. And the assistant chief officer, the position that I was fulfilling that still is today, but just changing title, has now gone to deputy chief officer. The reason for that is they're trying to line the whole sector up. And that's not just for MFV, it's for CFA, and it's also FFMV at the higher levels, so that we're all using common terminology and there is some synergy between the, the, the levels that we're operating at. Can you see right. the chat there, Trevor? Yes, I can, yeah. Beautiful. So, uh, in regards to volunteers at co-located stations in the future, how do you see the viability of those volunteers, considering the recent information that volunteers at those co-located stations will not be initially responded to calls within their community? So, it's a good question. So, we need to sit down with um, those brigades and have a conversation with them about what their capability is, what their capacity is to be able to respond. And in some cases, some of those brigades at what we know as integrated brigades that will become co-located brigades come the 1st of July, some may choose to be a brigade that's more in a support capacity. Um, you know, call us when needed, but otherwise, um, you know, we won't be able to be there at every call that you respond to or every time. So we've got to work through what that capacity and the capability of that brigade. And we've got good data on those brigades to have those conversations. Um, if a brigade, we know that FRV legislation requires them to call upon CFA, volunteer brigades to support them in the response to fire and emergencies. So just like many of our integrated brigades today, if it's an alarm call, in most cases, it's only the staff that respond. And then if it ends up being something more substantial than that, or they get multiple calls on top of that, then volunteers are responded. But if it's the rubbish bin, or it's the small car fire, or it's the reserve fire, or it's the alarm response, typically what happens is the staff respond. I don't see, and I'm happy to stand corrected, but I don't see that necessarily changing, providing the brigade's got the capability to respond. And it is legislated that they must call upon CFA to support and respond. Um, so I think that that will continue to do what we're doing today. I wouldn't be feared by the fact of the change coming the 1st of July to think that you're not going to be responded. Um, On that, Trev, sorry, just going to do, uh, it's Ray Gourlay, Franks, and I, I posted the question. We um, were told a couple of days ago by the OIC that, um, yeah, we wouldn't be responding initially unless the, OI, the incident controller actually specifically asked for us. Where a couple of months ago, when um, the reform team visited the station, it was indicated that the three levels, you know, business as usual, two was on an escalation or three specialist response. And we'd been under that impression in the last few months. Um, I believe, so as in the last 48 hours, we've been informed that that's not the case and FRV would only call the volunteers integrated brigades when the incident controller deems it necessary, which is disappointing because we'd been along that line of thing at the three levels. And that suited, especially as a brigade, we were looking at level one, business as usual, really. But um, yeah, we've since been informed the last 48 hours that's not the case. Yeah, look, thank you for sharing that with me. And I'll make some inquiries tomorrow because that's not my understanding of it at all. Um, again, there will be, um, without getting into the complexities of it, there's a GARS arrangement in the background. There's also an assignment type of table that actually allows for that in the background. Like at any event now, Ray, you know, you looked at Frankston now that the response um, could be instigated by the incident controller as they escalate the event um, and call for it. But I'll, I'll look, I will make some inquiries. It's interesting that you were told that it was different and now more recently it's different again um, yeah. because my understanding is that it shouldn't be that, it shouldn't be significantly different from what our current response is. 
Yeah, and that's what we've been led to believe, I'd say, up until the last 48 hours, yeah. Mm. So okay, can you leave that one with me? I will follow up because that's news to me. Um, and I would be surprised. I, I would be surprised because from a community perception, again, from um, a legislative responsibility, they must call upon and utilise CFA. That said, we need to understand because right across the state, depending on the brigade, some have good capability, some have good capacity um, and they can respond. Others uh, are not so good, you know, they're, they're struggling. Um, so we've got to be clear uh, to FRB, we've got to be clear to ourselves about what our, what our response capability and capacity looks like. And if that means that it's more of a support arrangement in a, in a call if needed type arrangement, then we've got to be upfront. Um, and we'll do that. Um, but if it is something where we can muster a response pretty quickly and, and get it out the door, I would assume it's probably no different to what it should be today, but I will I make believe, some inquiries. Yeah, and I believe that's why that they had those three levels of response I'm talking about here. Mm. But yeah, I'll wait your feedback, sir. Thanks. Sir. No, I will uh, leave your phone on and I will uh, follow that up tomorrow, but I do appreciate you, you letting me know because I, that's news to me. Okay. Move on to the next question from Ryan, which was, um, as you look after the largest urban area, what would you see as the future of urban volunteers as CFA? Seems to be portraying a bushfire angle. I'm, I'm liking this question already because I've got a view on this one. Um, in the PR material, in somewhat feeling like the urban voles are getting shadowed looking forward. Um, let's see if I still have a balanced focus in urban. Yeah, look, it's a really, it's a really good one. Um, CFA is incredibly well known um, within the community for our bushfire response. You know, that, that's what we're really known strongly for. Um, now, again, uh, whether you think that's just the way we're portrayed and, and we receive the media attention and, uh, you know, we do go to those bigger fires and we do wonderful work in uh, responding and supporting to the community and protecting lives and property, as do supporting FFMV and MFV in that arrangement as well. But we are really highly regarded as a bushfire organisation. That does not take away the fact, though, that as I said earlier, when I mentioned the number of pumpers that we have, some 78 in the region, um, and of that, we're still going to have 65 pumpers. Now, we only put pumpers into um, medium level communities. So, you know, when I talked about those 1,200 um, and, uh, sorry, the 1,200, I talked about the 223 brigades just in my region, um, a bulk of those brigades look after people's private infrastructure for every from houses to commercial to residential to um, industrial buildings, depending on the size of the community. But again, if you look at it on a base level of even saying, in a simplistic level of saying, you know, 78 pumpers looks after urban, that's where we position those and we only do it on the bigger urban communities and we're gonna still have 65 of them. We still have right across CFA, we need to break that out to every other region, which is gonna be in a similar case, a big responsibility to protect communities in urban areas. My personal view on this um, is that uh, we need to sell ourselves as a, um, a community-based fire and emergency service that delivers uh, a good capability in urban areas. Um, and also um, is well known for our bush firefighting capability, as we should be able to do in certain areas to provide things like we're discussing emergency medical response, and as we do when we support SES and other agencies to do with flood and a whole heap of other emergencies. So I think that um, whilst we're well known for that, and I can understand that with the terminology of Fire Rescue Victoria and paid career professional firefighters coming in, um, into uh, and, and, and growing, mind you, because that's always the way it's going to be as we continue to grow um, as well in communities, is that they're getting the attention for the structural bit because that's what they will specialise in and as they will do in the technical rescue bits and so forth. But that doesn't mean to say that CFA won't support and continue to provide those services in many, many communities across Victoria. But I do agree, it's important that uh, we see ourselves as more than just a bush firefighting organisation. And can I say, that will always be the case. Um, you know, and, and we need to make sure that uh, that organisation, the way the community sees us, is, is more broader than just the bush firefighting organisation in the future. Daniel, uh, have you had a chance to see the draft tenancy agreement or similar? I haven't actually seen the tenancy agreement um, in detail. Uh, so no, I haven't. Uh, it's still being worked on. 
as such. But the issue there is that um, we've been assured that in that tenancy agreement, there will be um, clearly an engine bay, um, possibly more in some cases, depending on the um, brigade and the assets of that brigade and the nature of the risk that will be given to CFA and things like meeting rooms and so forth and other areas that will provide access, um, even down to car parking, et cetera, that will be in a, uh, what we call a, a tenancy agreement, service level agreement that will, um, you know, ensure that the organisation maintains a capability at what will be, in the 1st of July, a transition to FRV assets at those integrated brigades. So for everybody else's knowledge, those stations that we know today um, using the example, Daniel Dandenong, Dandenong, uh, the station itself goes to Fire Rescue Victoria, the asset of the infrastructure transfers over, but there will be, um, you know, a, a, a tenancy agreement, as there are for anywhere, you're an occupant of the building. Um, and that's been worked through and that final detail's been worked through, Daniel, but I haven't seen the final draft. Right, one further question. How do you, how are the staff in the region feeling of the upcoming changes and is there feeling of losing their CFA family? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a really, um, that's a really, another really good question. And I say that because, you know, I've got a stake in the game. I mean, I explained earlier, you know, I, I started with CFA when I was an 11 year old and uh, passionate about the organisation, family interest in it. I have a brother, Daryl, uh, who's a senior station officer at Dandenong and he will transition across to FRV. Um, my position from Deputy Chief Officer and above will remain in the organisation. So we're on a different arrangement. We're not part of an operational agreement. We're part of an executive. Um, so I will remain as an employee of CFA. But the people that I came through with on my recruit course, the people that I know from the staffing level in an operational sense, even though I've done everything that they have in terms of their career, et cetera, and been through the various levels of a firefighter, a leading and a station officer all the way through to commander and um, ATFO or operations manager as they once were. I mean, I've followed that career, but I, I'm, they're, they're separating out. They're going that way. And whilst that, that management group in most cases will come back in secondment, they'll actually be employed by a different organisation. So I'd have to say, even from a personal point of view, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's changing. And, uh, you know, the, the, the one, one organisation that we once knew and the staff that we had that we all come through together, um, you know, they're going to another organisation. And for many that I'll still get to interact with, that I certainly have strong relationships with, uh, and that'll continue on regardless. Um, but yeah, it's, it's for, for, for many, uh, both our professional, technical and ministry staff, because mindful some of them are going to FRV. So, if you consider, you know, their role in some cases, payroll, um, people and culture, HR type roles that in and support, even training roles that support career firefighters, they move to FRV um, because that's where the career firefighters will be um, in the future. So it's a good question. And I'd have to say there's a whole lot of mixed feelings. And, you know, in some cases, uh, a bit of sadness about moving into um, or losing that aspect of it. Um, but I will say that, um, like anything, it's change and there's reasons for change. And, um, you know, even the people that are coming back on secondment from FRB into CFA, can I say my team are fully committed to this organisation, even though some of those will be employed by FRB um, on secondment back. So don't underestimate their feeling as well. And I say that because, you know, they're conscious that, They've come through the system like I, um, and they've had long serving careers in and working and supporting volunteers. And they don't want to be equally treated differently in the future either, because um, you know it's, it's not through their choice. Um, what's happened has happened. And, and uh, again, um, we just got to be mindful of people's, I suppose, uh, emotional state and their well wellbeing um, as we go through this level of change. Good question, good question. Um, I think I'm up to Gary, with the removal of the career stations from the budget of CFA, do you see that there will be more funds available for volunteer stations and building training? Look, I hope so. Um, I, I think, look, the, the development of career staff in recent times and the additional firefighters that we've seen, which includes trucks, new stations, upgraded facilities, that's a separate funding pool as part of a, um, what we call a, a 350 program 
that's separately funded by government. So I just want to make that clear that funding um, is not taken from CFA in the volunteer stream to fund what is the career firefighting stream. So we need to be clear about that. Um, however, what it will allow us to do is for the uh, executive of this organisation, from the board to the CEO to um, the directors to my positions and all the way through, concentrate and support and plan for and put up strong business cases for volunteer um, stations, trucks, um, and training and all those things that we need to develop as a, as a focused volunteer firefighting organisation. So um, I guess the, the time will tell, um, but I'd have to say sitting at my level, it's been challenging at times because we're trying to look over there and do stuff and keep that. And, and when I think of the growth areas, even as I spoke about before in that outer metropolitan Melbourne area, don't underestimate um, how fast that's growing and the development that that's incurring and what that means um, in terms of us, the sector being able to provide a, a service to those communities. So career firefighters need to grow, we'll do that. Uh, CFA needs to continue in, in supporting the background and work together with what will be a continual rollout over years and years and years um, as communities grow and responses get more and the risk changes. Um, but I think that CFA has an opportunity to do a concentrated effort now and just worry about how it services and supports volunteers which without without trying to service both. Because I'd have to say, at the highest level, it's really challenging for us to try and meet the expectations and all the service delivery requirements on this part and then try and do that all for volunteers. And you saw the uh, the map earlier. You know, we look after everything, you know, from the heavy merge, currently the commercial, the residential, the industrial areas, all the way through to um, the far reach, reaches of East Gippsland in the remote areas of Victoria. So, um, so I think I think I think we we can now say that we can concentrate on servicing in and for volunteers um, into the future, and I hope that in return brings an investment into the organisation through good, strong business cases and strategic planning in and for volunteers. Uh, Callum, um, so what sort of opportunities uh, do you see the interaction between CFA brigades and FRV brigades after the first of July? Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Um, so, for example, we've had some discussions. If you think of where I started at Springvale Brigade as a career firefighter out of recruits, um, if you think of Springvale Brigade now, um, Springvale Brigade have a strong affiliation with their community, um, as does Keysborough down the road, which is a volunteer brigade, but they will both continue to support community events. And community engagement for CFA, we are more than just a response agency. Uh, don't underestimate the um, our people on the ground uh, through brigades, and I'm talking everything from headquarters brigades to our um, you know frontline volunteer brigades out there um, with prevention, preparedness, community education, which is the key to protecting community. It's not just about response. So in places like Springvale, the expectation is that the brigade, if it chooses to do so, and we'll certainly encourage and support that will be uh, strongly linked to community engagement and preparedness and also education as they are today, even though that responsibility of that area will go to FRV. So working in partnership with FRV um, and talking about education and risk and um, you know, learning that goes with that will be continue to be a service that CFA will provide as we will do in a response um, aspect as well. So I see that, um, uh, Callum, that, that, that will continue on um, into the future um, in community events, training, etc. I, I actually, if I, if I draw upon for a moment um, and use what ha currently happens now. So MFB and CFA brigades do interact and train. Uh, in, you know, um, they do um, uh, respond to events in the outer metro interface area um, today, as they have done for decades. They get along, they get the job done, they are volunteers working beside MFB, professional CFA, professional career firefighters working side by side um, as one team. Uh, it works seamlessly today and I don't see that in the future that, that should be any different. You know, just, just in the fact that the rebranding into FRV, career firefighters from CFA moving into that organisation, why can't it be any, why 
why would it be any different to what it is today in terms of that relationship and how we respond, work together and train together happens today. If anything, I think there's an opportunity to get to a point where we can do more of it um, and we should be doing more of it together. Uh, Cameron, uh, with the future expansion of FRV boundaries in the metro area and new stations added, uh, will happen to the, what will happen to the volunteer stations? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, come the 1st of July, you know, we spoke about 12, 1220 odd brigades that CFA has across that of the whole state, of which in this region I have 223. The 1200 brigades don't change. We've still got on the 1st of July 1220 brigades. Um, across the state. We've still got in this region 1,223 fire brigades. Doesn't change. So uh, into the future, um, you know, the, if we um, maintain community interest, capability and capacity locally, understanding that those brigades may be a little bit different in what they can offer, and I touched on that a little bit earlier with Ray, you know, some brigades will have that capability to turn out straight away in and support. Others will be more of just a support and some may be more about community education. Um, there is still a role there for CFA in those areas. I don't see that just because um, an FRV brigade comes in or takes over um, that area that that sees the loss of a CFA brigade. But the, the, I think the key message in that is that we, CFA need to make sure that um, we get in and behind and it's up to local community and ourselves to, um, you know, ensure that we maintain a, a viable and sustainable service in those areas. Because if we can't, then, uh, you know, it will be totally the responsibility of FRB. Um, just on that subject though, I'm just mindful of the fact that, um, you know, CFA won't go into what is previously MFB area. Um, so it, it's where it transition over time into that of an FRV area where we currently have CFA brigade. So just mindful of, of that. Um, so Robert, uh, where is the volunteer station where process and will it be expanded to all volunteers, um, just not the leadership of brigades? Look, yeah, it's an issue. I, I have been waiting um, like you because what I want to see across our organisation, I'm sure the chief and everybody does at the highest level is seen as a, you know, a professional looking unit. You know, we want to look as though we're all part of it, um, that we're all wearing similar uniform, that, um, you know, in front of the community, uh, in front of our other stakeholders, that we look professional. And uh, it doesn't matter whether you volunteer, we look the part. And I think we're keen to get on and do the station wear. I agree, it would be nice if we could outfit everybody. Um, that comes with some expense. Uh, it will start off with the leadership group, but my understanding is there's discussions there about um, expanding that where we can and, and get some additional funding. And there's work that's occurring in the background for that, um, as well as it will be opened up for brigades, mindful of the fact that um, that we do have a number of brigades, even in this region, that are fairly well off, that have already raised the fact that they would like to go ahead and make up the difference by purchasing the uniform out of their own funds, um, which I think is a great initiative as well. So I think we will get there. I think the first step will be to roll it out, and I couldn't, it couldn't happen soon enough for me, and I think they're very, very close at doing that. I, I have seen... I've been privy enough to see the final product as such, and I'm very happy with it. It, it looks very, very smart, and uh, I can't wait to see our members out there in and wearing it. So it's not too far away, and it, it couldn't come soon enough, in my opinion. Um, where are we up to, Sam? Um, I was wondering uh, if you know how often class uh, brigade class levels get checked. Yep, um, whether they're two or three. So the essence of that is. Um, you as a brigade can initiate through your commander if you want a review of your brigade classification. So um, we're actually looking now at the definitions for brigade, brigade classification. We're taking the opportunity with the current um, reform piece to actually look at um, our future and the current brigade classification we think needs some further work and further refinement. So we're actually doing some work at the highest level on that. 
That said though, um, there is nothing preventing you now from raising that with your commander and having a discussion with your ACFO. And um, it's not uncommon for me to receive on behalf of a commander, on behalf of a brigade, at the recommendation of the ACFO to be reclassified. And if the evidence is there and it supports because of the increased risk uh, change in the brigade area, um, then obviously we'll support that. Um, so there's there's absolutely nothing to do. Do we do it on a um, on a defined period of once every two years or anything like that? No, but we need to. I think we just need to to get ourselves into a routine. But I would encourage you with the brigade annual review replacing the section 29. That is a discussion piece in that um, uh, annual brigade review. And if you think within your brigade and with the assistance of your BNT, if you think that you're the next category of brigade or you're a higher category, um, then by all means, you should be having the discussion at that level, um, either by inviting your commander or during your uh, annual brigade review. Um, Daniel, so just uh, my personal thought, has CFA uh, relocate volunteers in co-located stations, I'm losing it, uh, to vol volunteer stations in the area. I can see the capability to provide support if uh, the staff will be declined quickly due to limited access to appliances and rescue tools. So. Um, well, we have, but again, this is a, probably a discussion that we need to have with our integrated brigades about their future. And in some cases, if it is that, um, you know, can't be serviced, then obviously we'll have that discussion with the brigade. But ultimately, what we want to be able to do is maintain the brigade in its own right, even at those integrated stations, which will become co-located. That, that's where our efforts will be. Defining what that looks like will be the next piece of work. Um, I'm mindful that you know we, we want to be able to provide um, opportunities for all our members, um, understanding that you know unfortunately into the future where you know in the past where we have had and trained on things like pumpers and specialist appliances in some some stations uh, that that uh, that won't occur and it will be you know more of the tanker based. We'll still have a structural firefighting component, still be able to do BA at those, still be able to do rescue modules and things like that to do with generalist type rescue um, and things like that that you would expect in, in our mainstream brigade. So um, I can see the, 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 the capability where we're gonna try and maintain that, but understanding there will be uh, more of a delineation between um, FRV and CFA than what there has in an integrated environment where it's been under one roof. I hope that sort of answers the question. Um, Shane, uh, Steph said last week the government has not passed legislation of FRB boundaries for the 1st of July. Um, it was to revert to... Okay, so basically what's happening, the current um, assignment boundaries that we have at those integrated brigades um, come the 1st of July, that's, that becomes the FRV fire district, essentially. So, um, no different to really what it is today um, in those, you know, footprints that are set up under CFA for that particular brigade. So, if I think of a Terelgan brigade, for example, that footprint goes across to FRV. There is still a Terelgan fire brigade, um, but the responsibility, the accountability for that particular area becomes a FRV um, I'm not aware that, and, and again, Steph, I'm not doubting if, if that's what she said in terms of the boundaries, but my understanding is that come the 1st of July, those, those, those areas that will transition to FRV at those integrated stations, um, those assignment areas um, will be FRV, of which will be a support agency in those areas. But I will ask the question tomorrow. Um, so Trevor, uh, further to Cameron's question, there are rooms that FRB will take over the existing fully volunteer stations. Is there any truth to those regional rumours? Oh, look, I, 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 I'm trying to think now, um, I'll use an example, and again, I'm speaking out loud. If I think of Latrobe West, um, you know, Maui. So we, we've got a Maui Fire Brigade, we've got a New, Newbra Fire Brigade, 
um, and we've got a La Trobe West. The La Trobe West is a staff uh, going across FRV. Um, they will be operating out of their own station as will Moe and Newbra. Um, we haven't seen the replacement of the Moe fire station and you know volunteers being removed from that area. Um, and can I say the relationship between the career firefighters and that of the volunteers in that area is, um, is strong and will continue to be strong, uh, even though they'll be operating from separate facilities. Um, so I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not fearful of volunteers being pushed out at all, but we do need to make sure that we can provide a sustainable and good capability and capacity for the risk in that area. We, we, you know, we're putting dollars, the government's putting, community's putting dollars into us. We've got to make sure that we uh, have a meaningful uh, service that we can provide and support to FRB in those areas. But I'm unaware of anything of that nature and I'd be very surprised and, and, and like you, very disappointed if that were to be the case. Um, Ross, I uh, find it hard to understand that COVID has not slowed the implementation of FRV. Um, it is the reason for holding up uh, vol projects such as rollout of structural helmets. Um, yeah, look, I, I think there's a whole lot of legislative, and it's a good question, Ross. I think there's a whole lot of, um, I suppose, legislative, uh, you know, the, the government's made the decision, everybody's been working towards it. Um, therefore, you know, I think they're keen to see, obviously, is a legislative piece, but also the government is keen to see that that's commenced as they um, said they were commissioned to do on the 1st of July this year. So um, I take your point that there has there is some things across the organisation in regards to some projects which have slowed up because of the issue to do with the COVID-19. And that's somewhat to do with the interaction and social distancing, which we hope to be able to uh, return to a degree of normality and continue those projects. Um, and I'm sure you'll receive some information from the Chief over the next few days and weeks with the, um, I suppose, some of those restrictions being released and some of those projects being enabled once again. Uh, Sarah, um, management of gas leaks, ruptured gas pipes for brigades further east, having to wait 1.5 hours uh, for gas plumbing company to respond from Terrell and Warrigal. Um, I didn't know that. So, yeah, so it's over uh, an hour and a half. We've had to wait up to three hours sometimes, if not more. Yeah, that's, um, that's fascinating in itself. Um, so, again, I'll take that up uh, with the Regional Emergency Management Planning Committee, but also... Um, yeah, those agencies, because, yeah, waiting an hour, I would have thought that they would have had somewhat of a decentralised, whether it be power, whether it be gas, those utility services should be a lot closer than um, than what I would have thought out of um, out of Terrelgan or Warrigal. That just seems, <laughs> knowing that patch, knowing how big this region is. There you go. Tyler's actually said that it takes an hour or more for to come from Warrigal. So generally they've got an hour to respond and then... They're based in Terrelgan or Warrigal. So if they've got an hour to respond, then travel time to Bansdale, Painsville, further east. It's We've sat there for hours waiting for them to turn up when we have capable people. Yeah, time. well, considering we're pushing ahead with a BA filling station for Bansdale to be able to, again, um, increase our capability into some of these rather than having to travel to places like Moore to fill BA... Uh, when I see other agencies providing critical services, I would have thought that, uh, again, that service could be provided a bit more locally. So if you can leave that one with me, it's a good one. I'll raise it, raise it with the Regional Emergency Management Planning Committee because if it's taken an hour and a half, that's... Uh, I'll chat with Aaron with. if you need more info. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan, uh, truth to the rumours, bad time for... for uh, this, that's a kind of CFA stuff that wear FRV uniform doing their CFA job. Um, yeah, look, it's a, it's a really good one. Um, I, I will give you the line that's coming from our Chief Officer, um, is that, uh, you know, we see that the people that are working in and for CFA as the organisation um, should be wearing um, the CFA uniform. Um, that's our position. Um, now, obviously, that's going through um, a level of negotiation and obviously um, there's a level of different opinion on that. But 
um, I understand and can I say, uh, so do my, uh, you know, that the people that are working across those districts, they are very aware of what um, that means and why that may be seen um, by volunteers, particularly the, the members who we're actually servicing and, and supporting. So again, I, I don't have an answer to that um, other than to say that um, our position is that, uh, you know, secondaries um, should be in wearing uh, what is CFA uniform. Understanding that, you know, they are employed by FRV. But again, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what comes of that, but I do know our Chief's position and that of the Executive on that particular matter. Um, I mean, uh, so Tyler, I'm in Warrigal. Um, take me an hour or more for the gas company to arrive. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And um, again, I'll, I'll take that up with the Gippsland Regional Emergency Management Planning Committee, because some of these things where we're getting delayed services, they impact on volunteers. So, you know, you respond uh, to support communities, the best that we can do and the best that other support agencies can do is get there quickly and swiftly to be able to um, repair the leak, do their job so that you can be released and turn home, return home or to return to your employment. Um, so I will take that up. Um, uh, so will, uh, will we continue to see FRV trucks responding 20 to 30 minutes out of their own turnout area like we currently do in Cadinia Group. So um, if there's a need to support, um, understanding that FRV has responsibility to their fire district, but there will always be continued support arrangements between CFA and FRV in the interest of protecting community. So there will be a consultation piece. Um, obviously there's the district fire review panel that We'll have a talk about risk as well and be monitoring that in the background. But as far as the supporting arrangements, that'll be between the agencies to have those conversations. Because regardless of whether you know, you're know you FRV, regardless of whether you're CFA, that we're there for a common interest and we're there to respond and support in the closest possible time with the best of service that we can and work beside and in and supporting one another. So, um, you know, not knowing the detail, but I would suspect that if there's an issue to do with um, response in the Cadinia group and uh, the service can be provided, and providing that of FRV are comfortable to continue to leave their primary um, fire response district uh, and consider the backup mechanism, which in this case today, the packet and volunteers um, in and support when the staff respond well and truly beyond that of the packet and footprint. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that that will be an ongoing discussion, but again, that will be a discussion that we'll be having externally, not necessarily internally like we have been, but I don't think that that will be an issue. Uh, Tyler, uh, on the topic of BA filling stations, are there plans for them within Southeast region? Um, there is a state plan uh, that's uh, been implemented. Um, uh, I'm just reading about the VST, which was knocked back, BSP, sorry, um, as there were several others around the state. So this, uh, it, the BA strategy is an interesting one because what it looks at is positioning BA filling stations across the state at strategic locations that we can reasonably um, respond a vehicle to and from if we need to refill, refill cylinders. It also, in that strategy, refers to acacias of cylinders. So we're going to have, um, you know, bulk um, caches in nominated locations where the tyranny of distance and the risk says that we need to, we can't, it's not worth putting in a filling station, but we need to, in case we do have a, a, a larger emergency, have something that's in a reasonable distance that we can respond cylinders to and from. So we're going to end up with a mixture of, um, in the future, vehicles that will be like in a transit type van that will be strategically located which will be responsible as another brigade support activity to the district or the region to respond cylinders um, you know some distance but be able to transport those cylinders to and from the fire ground as we will um, have in the background um, more strategically located filling stations now filling stations are very, very expensive they're not they're not it's one thing to um, pay for the install, um, but it's another thing to pay for the ongoing maintenance, which there's you know, obviously, you know, uh, anything to do with protective equipment and particularly where we're refilling and putting air into cylinders. 
um, it needs to be incredibly well maintained through a very strict regime. So it's incredibly expensive too. It's not just the cost and the outlay initially, you've got to maintain that. So we will end up with a mixture of services to how we will provide BA into the future, but you will see in some districts a rolling out of more BA at strategic locations to respond to and from. And you will see um, a smaller increase in filling stations. And on top of that, you will still see in some locations um, a mobile capability for the filling of cylinders. Um, but, um, but it'll be a mixture of all those three elements. At the moment, we don't really have transport um, arrangements, good secure using transit type vans. Um, we've really got a mobile filling station which takes some distance to get to some of those locations in the middle of the night. Um, and then we've got our fixed filling station. So you will see some um, improvements start to take shape over um, months and years that will align to that strategy. Uh, Ryan, uh, further to Todd's question, any info on swap and go? Oh, okay, so swap and go. So what they're looking at, um, and we, we're not quite there yet because there's a tracking cylinders and um, making sure that um, you know, they're being maintained and we know where they are at any given point in time um, is, is, is not an easy process because you've got to be able to do that and track them anywhere at any given point in time because they are a critical asset and we've got to be able to demonstrate that from a health and safety point of view at all times we know their history and where they've been. So that's the piece that we're working on at the moment but the future for it is, is there will be a, um, a swap and go facility. So no longer in the future is it the intent that you will go to a filling station wait for um, somebody to fill your cylinder um, or have to then do some shopping and then come back to pick up the cylinder. The idea will be no different to, you know, your gas barbecue cylinder. You'll be able to attend that premise, pick up your cylinder and replace it and off you go. The bit that we're working on the background with uh, protective equipment is about how we track that. That's the critical bit, how we keep how we keep a register, all that, and how we do that efficiently and easily. So there's a number of things that they're looking at. Um, so that's not too far away. Uh, don't get, quote me on the time, but it's not far away. It's the only issue is about getting the caches in position and then how we end up tracking them through a, a system. Um, okay, what do one final question? Thanks, Sarah, for the prompt there. Uh, um, there's a couple there after uh, mine. Okay, I'll finish those ones off. Um, Brigadier Bendigo uh, staff can and do respond 100 kilometres away. Uh, would volunteer brigades still be expected to step up? We need it. Um, absolutely. So, um, you know, it's no different to any of the current districts where we're running um, integrated career firefighters. Uh, there will always be the bigger events. There will always be the days when, um, you know, whether it be through um, fire activity, uh, wind conditions, storm activity, when we're all running hard. And that means that at times there, I expect that FRB stations will be, as does happen from time to time. When we've had volunteer um, brigades in District 8, for example, in and supporting when times of emergency on a larger scale into the Metropolitan Fire District. And they provide a liaison officer that comes in and is runs with, with the crew or on the station. Um, I don't see that as any different into the future. There will always be times when, you know, for whatever reason, we're run, running short and that we will need to continue. And that means it includes move-ups um, uh, into stations, whether that be CFA or MFB into the future. Um, so don't discount that. I'm not sure whether you're thinking that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, Gary, simple question, when uh, FRV, uh, sorry, uh, when FRB comes in, will they refer to uh, FRZ trucks by their number or name? So they'll be, um, they will be, yeah, Pumper 88, for example. That That's that's their, um, you know, ladder platform, whatever. Um, it'll be um, rescue number. So it, it, it will be by that. Now, the thing that we'll have to get used to is that, um, as I, and I keep referring back to a Springvale Brigade, but Springvale Brigade will effectively turn out as Springvale Brigade, or in this case, Hallam Brigade will turn out as Hallam Brigade and um, as a CFA Volunteer Brigade on the tanker as Hallam Tanker, but the pumper will turn out as Pumper 88 if that's the number they are. So that's, that's the difference that we'll have to get used to. So whilst they're effectively under one roof, um, 
they will turn out as a number and our people will turn out as their identifying community name. And one more question from Cameron. Uh, change in data revisiting vehicle topology as we have recently been told there are no medium pumpers being built yet. Our brigades have been told they're over, told over the last four or five years and mostly recently early this year that they would receive one by the end of June. Now, yeah, it, it, it's we are still going to see pumpers coming to CFA, and I've had the discussion with um, asset services, and the view is that we will continue to provide pumpers, and they will roll out as medium pumpers. Um, there aren't any being built at this point in time, but there are plans afoot to build uh, another program, just as there are tankers. Um, obviously, funding as it comes in, um, and as we can through our capital works program, but we do rely on the top up of government funding to be able to support some of those bigger programs of the replacement of appliances. But let me assure you that it, we will be building uh, pumpers in the future. I am understanding that there was a program of medium pumpers, uh, of which were converted into tankers because we had a, a very aging fleet or our aging fleet of tankers is far more serious to replace in some areas. Um, therefore, that funding arrangement to support tankers uh, was where some of that funding that was going towards medium pumpers. But the next round, we'll see, um, you know, a future um, program of um, uh, medium pumpers being developed, as there will be tankers as well. Timing of that, I'm not exactly sure, but, um, uh, yeah, it won't be four or five years or anything like that. It'll be far sooner than that, I can assure you that. Sarah, we've been going at it for a, it. a couple of hours. Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, greatly appreciated. Again, some good topics there. So um, thanks everyone for joining. We had um, 53 at the height of the session tonight. And it's still great to hear from people from right across the state. So thank you all very much. Um, we do have some more good sessions lined up. Next week, we've got the Prescribed Burn Task Force. Um, I think they're wanting to do a little bit of recruiting as well. So um, it'll be interesting to listen to them and have a chat. And then uh, the following week, we've actually got um, Lakes Rescue. And we'll talk about their equipment, what they've got, and how you as a brigade or brigade members can assist them before rescue gets on scene. So um, a couple of good sessions lined up. Again, message me privately on Facebook if you've got ideas for sessions that you want. Um, Steve and I have a number of people in the background that we've got lined up to ask um, and we've got some in the future so thank you all again for attending thanks very much Trevor and be safe thanks everyone good night